I guess we can uh, start. Let me start to welcome all of you. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this finally plenary session of the MMF conference. We have the pleasure of having Olivier Blanchard speaking on arguably the key policy issue today and the years to come. Olivier is a Fred Bernstein Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics and also Robert Solo, Professor of Economics Emeritus at the MIT. Uh, he obtained his PhD at MIT. I guess he spent some time in Harvard, went back to MIT, but also spent time in the policy arena as uh, uh, economic counselor and the director of research department at the IMF. And needless to say, uh, Professor Blanchard needs no introduction. We all learn from his work in macroeconomics through his papers, through his teaching, through his textbooks, and also through his, uh, 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 through the court of extraordinary students who had the luck to study with him. And over the years, we became familiar with the economic analysis and advice he contributed to basically every critical area of the policy debate. In the likely case you are not familiar with Olivier, Google this name and you will find about a million uh, entry. Good luck with, with, uh, with reading them. Uh, the topic today is at the heart of the policy debate in the US and worldwide. Uh, I don't know what uh, uh, Olivier is going to say today, but as an international economist, I'm looking forward to it, to hear more about uh, the issue that I see related to global inflation, to capital flows, to the role of the dollar, to global stability, but also the future shape of international institutions. So from my seat, I'll be ready also to ask questions. Uh, uh, Ricardo Reis will be the question master, master at, uh, in the last uh, 15, 20 minutes. Use please the question um, uh, facility in your uh, platforms to ask written questions that uh, Ricardo will administer. And uh, I will close the conference uh, giving back the uh, podium to Paul Meisner. Okay, Olivier, it's, uh, I took even too much time from your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Giancarlo. Thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, Giancarlo, I'm afraid that I'm not going to answer all the questions that you raised, but uh, I think I'll answer some. Uh, the background for this is that I started being obsessed with fiscal policy on the low rates uh, in around 2018 or so. I wrote my AEA presidential address on that, and I've been thinking about it ever since. I'm in the process of writing a, a short book, uh, which is aimed at, at policymakers, uh, to them, but they have to change the way uh, they are thinking about fiscal policy in that environment. So there's a sense in which this lecture is kind of a cliff notes version of, of, of the book. Uh, and uh, I'll do my best to give you the, the essence of what I see as, as, as the main uh, result. On the assumption that you can see my slide, which I think you do, right? Uh, let me just let me just give some motivation, some uh, some introduction. So, as as you know, uh, the advanced economies are, have faced now for a while uh, very low nominal and real rates. Uh, nominal rates in most advanced economies are either zero or actually negative. And behind this, there are two important uh, aspects. Uh, which we have to separate because they have different implications, but together they have very strong implications. The first one is what's known as secular stagnation. And so the first step is to define the safe neutral rate or natural rate of interest, R star, which is the rate which is consistent with output and potential. Uh, the evidence is that R star is a very low number at this point. Uh, if we take R star to be even lower than R for other reasons, which I come back to, uh, it is you know minus two, minus three percent. The nominal rates are at zero. Inf expected inflation is around two, uh, so it's very, very low, and it's clearly much lower than the growth rate. And an environment in which R star or R is less than G, than than G is is an environment which is quite different and we're not used to it. We haven't seen it in the past in the same way and we have to think about the implication. The other aspect which is terribly important, which is conceptually very different 
that interacts with the first one is what's known as the zero lower bound. But given that we've learned that we can go a bit below zero with nominal rates, it's now called the effective uh, lower bound. And it's a statement that given that we can't get nominal rates to really go negative, and maybe we can do you know, 50 basis points, 70 basis points. This together with very low expected inflation implies that central banks are not able to get the rate, the real rate, which is the rate which matters for aggregate demand, uh, low enough. And that's a constraint which puts very strong constraints on the central banks. It takes two forms. I think today it's strictly binding in the sense that most central banks are really at the lowest nominal rate they can be, and they cannot do more. Uh, there's QE, there's various things, but it's, it's second order. Uh, but even if, and I expect this will happen, the rates were starting to increase a bit as aggregate demand becomes stronger and the central banks feel they can increase them, it will still be potentially binding in the sense that even if nominal rates go to say 2%, we're very far from that, uh, the room that the central banks would have to actually decrease the rate if there's an adverse shock uh, would be would be very small. It would be two three percent at most, which is much less than what they have used in the past. So together, they have very strong implications for all kinds of things, for the way we think about fiscal and monetary policy. And I've decided to focus on on fiscal policy in my work. There are so many work, people working on monetary policy because you know all the central banks have big research departments. But in contrast, if you look at treasuries. There are many fewer people working on these issues. There are some academics, obviously, but in general, many less people. So I think you know it makes sense to actually focus on this. What I want to do in my talk is take three issues. The first one is what will happen to interest rates in the future? Uh, are we going to face both secular stagnation and uh, the effective lower bound in the future? That's central. If what we were seeing was something which was going to go away, then the old wisdom would come back and uh, there would be not much new to say. The answer will be yes. I mean, I think we can expect that situation to last for quite a while. Then I want to turn to fiscal policy as such. Uh, the two things, the first one is how do we assess debt sustainability in an environment of such low rates in which R is less than G? And as you know, there are major debates about this. And then leaving aside debt sustainability. I mean, suppose we find we can have much higher debt. It doesn't mean that we should use it. it, just means that we have room to use it. And so the third question will be, well, how do we conduct fiscal policy in that environment? Do we go to the limit? Or do we go more uh, conservative? That's what I want to discuss. So three parts. Let me, you know, this is not fiscal policy, but it's clearly essential. Uh, the first part clearly essential to thinking about fiscal policy in the future. So let me go through a series of graphs, which I find uh, you've seen some of them, uh, maybe not all of them, uh, which I find very striking. So the first one basically gives you the evolution of the 10 year real rates. So basically using 10 year nominal rates on government bonds minus 10 year forecast of inflation. Easy to get for the US, relatively easy for the Euro, harder for Japan, but you can do it. And this gives you the real rates. And I start in 1992, and you can see that basically this has been a fairly steady decline with Japan being ahead. So for a while, we talked about the Japanese issue, but we learned that could happen to others. Uh, but basically, more or less a continuum. Uh, the point being that you know it is not the great the global financial crisis. It made a bit of a dent. We went to lower rates, but this is not it. it clearly, is something which happened before and continues after. Same thing with the current COVID crisis. Uh, you know, it is not the source. I mean, it started in late 1992. We were not thinking about COVID. Now, there's a way of making the graph even more striking, and sometimes it's done this way. It's starting in 19, 1985. And the reason for this is 1985 was basically the last year of disinflation, of the programs of disinflation. So by then, the real rates were extremely high. And so if you start in 85, it looks even more drastic. But you know, I think we have to leave them out to understand why they were high then. It's not what we're thinking about. So I think the first conclusion is, look, it, 
it may go away, but it's not something which just came and will likely go away. It has been going on for a long time. The second graph, many of you probably have, set, have seen it by somebody called Schmelzing, which basically constructs a history of a safe real rate since 1325. So starting with boring by Venice and then going from country to country and finding a safe rate. It's a fascinating paper, but what's even more fascinating is uh, how it comes out. And you know, if you do it year by year, it moves all over the place. But if you do a center moving average, using 20 years as the, uh, as the sample, then it gives that picture. And you can see that there's something very deep, which is that the safe rate really has decreased through time. Now, in the last 40 years, since 1992, or the last 30 years, it has decreased faster. Uh, and clearly, there are episodes there that I'm not going to go into, into which it was even lower. But these are really different from what we're seeing today. This, I think, makes me think that we have to think of really fundamental factors. So, for example, the fact that as countries get richer, people get richer, they save more. Very poor countries today even save very little. Uh, but liquidity is something which really takes a lot of work. And, you know, T-bill market today is very liquid. If you had wanted to unload your Venetian uh, bonds uh, in 1325, I suspect you would have found it a bit harder. And I think that says, look, there is really a trend. And what we've seen is an acceleration of the trend. There are clearly many factors at work, but that's what this suggests. The third graph gets to a discussion that I've seen and I think is, is misleading, which is, oh, well, growth has decreased and therefore interest rates have decreased. And many people are in what, you know, what's known as the Euler equation mode, in which the two are closely connected. But I would argue that the Euler equations don't apply to the real world and don't apply to output growth and interest rates. So what I've done here is actually look at R minus G. So the series for R is uh, basically the forecast real rate uh, as of a given year. And that's the same graph as the one you saw earlier, but that's now for the US in red. And then the, do the same thing for growth. And that's the 10-year forecast of real growth starting again in 1992. And you can see that something has happened, uh, which is that growth has dec decreased a little bit, but not very much in terms of forecast, nearly none. And what really has happened is R has decreased much more than G. So the notion that G and R are closely related uh, is not a very strong theoretical grounds, I and mean, I think you can think of relations, and it's in general not very strong in terms of empirical grounds. Uh, that the point I wanted to make. The other point I wanted to make was that you can think, so when, when we go to factors behind, uh, you know, the decrease in, 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 in safe rates, you can think of two classes of factors. The first one is saving and investment, right? Larger saving relative to investment leading to a decrease in the rate of smaller investment. Or you can think of risk. And an increase in risk or an increase in risk aversion would lead to an increase in the risky rate and a decrease in the safe rate. And it can be restated as a demand for safe assets, which would lead to a lower safe rate. And so I think that's an interesting graph. It basically plots the real long-term rate. So it's again, the same series, the safe rate, 10 year safe rate in blue. I should probably have kept the same color, but now it's blue. Uh, and on the other hand, I construct a series for the expected return on stocks and I use Gordon's formula, which is that Gordon's formula says you can think of the expected return on stocks as the dividend price ratio plus the growth rate of dividends over the horizon that you're looking at. I don't have a growth, I don't have forecast for the growth rate of dividends. I have forecast for the growth rate of output. I assume dividends will go like output, which is not a bad assumption. And that gives you a red line. And so the conclusion from this, which I think is really important, is you know, visually striking, is that basically the decrease in the safe rate has been much larger than the decrease in the risky rate. So if you want to tell the story of what's happening, saving investment, you can basically find factors, and I think there are some, but clearly an increase in risk uh, or in perceived risk or an increase in risk aversion is clearly part of the story. 
Where does it come from? There are some institutional reasons to think that this is happening. Banks have to hold more liquid assets and so on. I think there is more at stake. But this is basically how I, you know, this is, I think, an interesting, it's very difficult to point to the exact factors. But I think this says of the two sets of factors, both are probably important. And again, in the book, I go much more in detail, but that's the message I want to do at this stage. So let me end this part with two slides. The first one is, where do I stand? You know, when policymakers ask, well, what's going to happen to interest rate? Uh, I'm very much uh, influenced by this long downward trend uh, since the 1300. Uh, uh, it really suggests that there's something going on, you know, not as strong as we have, but there's something going on, both on the saving side and on the liquidity side. Um, the, we clearly care about, you know, a shorter time interval, but the downward trend since 1992 is striking, right? It is basically this continuous decline. It is very common to all countries. Japan started earlier, but now most countries are in the same situation. And what's behind is probably some saving factors, some investment factors, risk aversion, perceived risk. When I sit down, I don't expect any of these to dra dramatically uh, change uh, direction and lead to a much la larger, a very large increase in interest rates. So all this is to think about fiscal policy. What do I conclude? So I conclude that there might be bumps. Uh, and I think on this, the markets are probably a bit too optimistic. You know, if you have a very expansionary fiscal policy, like the Biden stimulus, which was passed about uh, six months ago now, uh, it could well be that the Fed will have to react and increase interest rates quite a bit as the kind of tsunami of demand uh, comes. And so I think we may see short run R uh, increase G for some period. But fundamentally, uh, unless fiscal policy is expansionary on a very wide scale for a very long time, I think that will remain on the after less than G mode, uh, the so-called secular stagnation mode, uh, but not with probability one. And so when you think about giving advice, you have to say, well, this is very likely, but if this happened, what would you do? And therefore, how does it affect things that you want to do today? Um, I still don't feel that we really understand there are very good paper by uh, Rachel and Smith, by uh, Rachel and Summers and so on. Uh, I don't think we have a full understanding of the causes. So I don't think we can exclude uh, a reversal or star getting greater than G, but I think it's a low probability event. Now, this is on the secular stagnation side. On the ELB, the effective uh, lower bound side, I suspect that sooner or later, probably in, in the year or the two years to come, we'll move away from the strictly binding ELB. We'll see positive rates, uh, probably faster in the US than, uh, than in Europe. But we will still have the ELB as a potential constraint. It will still not give much room for monetary policy to help if there is a decrease in demand. And this, this means that if something happens, fiscal policy will probably have to play a role. Let me end with one slide, which is giving not my views, but what investors expect and, and put money on. So this is derived from option prices on, the, on, on government bonds for the US, for uh, Europe and for the UK, five years out and so on, and 10 years out. So, you know, we could spend a bit of time looking at the at the table, but the point is go to the last column, and that gives you the probability that investors give, as implied by the prices they are willing to pay on options, uh, which pay either if it goes above four or below four. Uh, basically, they see a ninety three percent to ninety nine percent five years out that the rate will be less than four percent. And the probability remains very high, 86% uh, to 95%, 10 years out. Now, why is 4% interesting? Because 5% is most likely, is the best guess of what nominal growth will be. 
of 2%, uh, now 2% inflation and 2% real. So I think the investors are fairly convinced, it's not 100%, very convinced that this will go on. And in that way, uh, I agree with them. So let me now move to the second part, which is that sustainability. Uh, and, and here, as you know, basically opinions are all over the place. Uh, the current levels of debt are very high. I could have given you a table, but in many countries, you know, net debt is above 100%. And you have the whole gamut of opinion. Uh, not really surprisingly, you have uh, Wolfgang Schuble, uh, you know, the ex-former Minister of Finance of Germany, saying, well, we really have to start doing something a bit uh, like the fiscal austerity we had after the great financial crisis. This cannot go on. We have to decrease debt. And then you have Paul Krugman, who says, don't worry, that is not an issue anymore. Uh, I think at, at, at a minimum, we have to agree that this threshold that we had pre that uh, basically are irrelevant. Uh, that the notion that 60% or 90% is you know, a magic number, and if you go above, you're in trouble, that may have been true in the past. So I'm not questioning what, uh, what had, you know, the work which has been done on that, but it's clear that it's not relevant today. And Japan is, is, is the obvious example, which is that gross debt is about 250%, but net debt is still 177%. And you know, they are paying negative rates on, on 10 year bonds. So it's clear that the level of sustainable debt is very different if a safe rate is 10%, as it was, used to be, or 1%, as, uh, as I mean, this is even higher than what it is today. So let me just go through, uh, you know, basic algebra on the, on the debt dynamics to make, make a few points. And again, I suspect for most of you, this will be uh, very familiar. So the, the debt dynamic equation is, is well known. D is the debt ratio. It's the ratio of debt to output, which is clearly what we care about. Um, R is the real rate. G is the real growth rate. S is the primary surplus. And so basically, as that accumulates, it accumulates at rate R, but output increases at rate D. This explains the 1 plus R over 1 plus G. That is equal to 1 plus R over 1 plus G times that last time. And clearly, if we have a primary surplus, this decreases with that ratio. So that equation is just arithmetic. Uh, we can ask, you know, Suppose we want to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio at some level. So we put D is equal to D minus one, and we find that the primary surplus S must be equal to R minus G over one plus G times D. Now, in general, R minus G in the textbooks and in the past many points was positive. So the conclusion was, well, if you have debt today, you'll have to have primary surpluses in the future. So you have to increase taxes or decrease spending, but you'll have to do something. Now, when R minus G is negative, as is the case now, say minus three or minus 4%, then it goes the other way. You basically can sustain, stabilize the debt to GDP ratio uh, while running primary deficits. So there are three ways of, of stating that conclusion, which go from, I think, the milder one, which is you can run a primary deficit and keep the debt ratio constant. So, you know, today, if you think that debt is roughly 100%, R minus G is minus 3%, then you can run a primary deficit of 3% and that, that ratios will not increase. There's a stronger proposition, which is, well, you can actually run any primary deficit and then increase for a while, but it will not explode, right? Because basically the coefficient on lag debt is less than one. So if you decide to run a primary deficit of 4% and R minus G is minus 3%, then debt will increase to 150% and it will stabilize that, not the end of the world, maybe. Uh, the third way of saying it uh, is that you can issue additional debt once, so you can have a deficit once, and then you never raise taxes to pay for it. Well, what will happen is that basically the debt ratio will decrease back to where it was before, uh, because again, uh, R minus G is, is negative. So, you can issue, you know, this whole proposition that higher debt means higher taxes later and we're burdening future generations is just not true in this case. You can actually increase debt and you never have to raise taxes. Now, you can state it this way and it's very strong, but it's too strong. 
And, uh, you know, I set it up, but I think it's important to understand why it's too strong. So let me just move on. There are two reasons why it's too strong. The first one is on the genuity, which is, okay, suppose you, you, know, you buy that and you start having large deficits. And, well, the larger the deficits, the more you're going to increase aggregate demand. Therefore, the higher the central bank will have to increase the rate, the higher R star, the higher R. And maybe at some point, you may actually have reverse the inequality and R become greater than G. So there's clearly a limit from the fact that if you use it, then R star will increase and R star minus G will be less negative. The other aspect, which I think is even more important, and that's where I think there's a lot of useful work to be done, is that, you know, in expected value, R will remain less than G for a long time. We saw that uh, in earlier slides. But expected values is not the relevant thing. It's the distribution. It's what's the probability that, uh, you know, that is sustainable and that depends on the uncertainty about what will happen to R minus G. It could be that R will actually increase. Maybe it's a small probability, maybe not. So the point I want to make is that given the uncertainty, which I think is really first order, that sustainability is always a probabilistic, a probabilistic statement. Uh, there's no such thing as absolute certainty. So I suggest the following definition as a way of making progress. What is the probability that over the next five, 10 years, the country cannot generate a primary surplus S sufficient to cover interest payments, R minus G, defined as R minus G times D. So clearly, if it cannot do this, then there's an issue, because if S is less than that, then that will increase. So, you know, actually, that's actually wrong. I should say a primary balance, because you actually uh, have a primary deficit in this case. If a probability is small, then that is sustainable. I think that's an operational definition, which is actually useful. So I've been working a bit on, in the context of EU rules about how you might want to assess that sustainability in practice. And I've concluded that you probably should do it in two steps. The first one is you should basically do it on our existing policies, which is very much the way CBO does it uh, in the US. So what you should do is assume some distribution of R minus G, either based on the past, based on these option prices we saw, uh, where what matters is not just the expected value, but the whole distribution, and it's especially the tails. You should take into account implicit liabilities. You know, it may be that your social security system is going to basically need funds from the general budget that you should be taking into account. You should basically think about the path of a primary balance or a primary deficit. And again, you should think not as what you expect, but what could happen if there's a recession, something like this. Okay, you should do this, and then you should basically look at what happens at the end of five or 10 years to the debt ratio and to whether it's increasing or not. That seems to be, uh, oh, you can look at the condition I gave on the previous page. Now, if this is fine, and I think at this stage, if you have to do this, you'll conclude it's fine. But if it's not, then, you know, an adjustment is needed. And so you need to go to step two. And I think here, it's a different step for the government, which must suggest solutions, and for investors to decide whether they trust the government to do it or not. So there's a number of factors which matter. The initial tax rate, if it's already very high, it's going to be very hard to increase taxes further, and therefore to increase the decrease the deficit or increase the surplus sufficiently. It depends on the nature of the government. Uh, if there is a large adjustment, then you need to actually get it through parliament, or you know, whatever system you have. And so if you're a coalition, you're much less likely to succeed. So again, for investors, the government may promise things, but investors will say, well, given what we've seen, it's probably not going to happen. The third factor, which is very important, plays a role at many points, uh, is the maturity of the debt. Uh, if you have long maturity debt, then even if a short rate starts moving up a lot, it will take a long time to, for it to actually affect substantially your debt service. You basically give your long rates, you know, most of the rates on your long maturity debt are set and they're not going to move. So it gives you much more time to adjust. If you have, you know, one year debt and suddenly R just jumps, you have to 
create, you know, find a large increase in taxes or spending, and it's going to be very hard. So I've been doing work on this. I think this is workable. The analytical tool, which is the right one for this, is that sustainability analysis, but stochastic that sustainability analysis, and to my great pleasure, I see it being used in a number of countries now. And then the way to enforce it, as opposed to having a rule, uh, which you check or not, check is satisfied or not, I think is you want this to be done by an independent fiscal council. And I think we now have in many countries, very good fiscal councils, very independent ones, and they are the right place to do it and send signals both to the government and to the market. So, what, so I was talking about methodology, but let me talk about implications you know, for the issue we care about, that sustainability. Two points. The first one is if the main source of uncertainty is R minus G, and I truly believe it is. Uh, the rest, yes, there is uncertainty about our growth, but it's not as big as you know, R minus G, R can move a lot. Then the point is, suppose you embark on fiscal austerity now in order to reduce the risk of that sustainability, unsustainability, uh, it's not going to make much difference to the probability of sustainability. And I give an example. And suppose that the standard deviation of R minus G is 3% of the sum horizon. So if you have debt at 100%, then the standard error standard deviation of your debt service is 3% of GDP. Suppose you go for really tough fiscal austerity and you reduce the debt ratio to 90%. And I assure you, that's not easy to do with low growth. Okay. Then the standard deviation of debt service, R minus G times B, goes down from 3% to 2.7%. Basically, it doesn't do much. Now, if you could magically go to 60% or 40% debt, would be great, but you can't. And therefore, that's just doing fiscal austerity to decrease the probability of sustainability, I think is not the way to go. However, there is a better way, which is what markets worry about is really the tails. And so if you have contingent plans on what happens if R minus G times B moves a lot, if R minus G moves a lot, then markets will basically you know, be much less worried. So I show in, in the book that if you have a rule in which the surplus responds to uh, a debt service uh, with a coefficient A, uh, and it could be nonlinear, it could not respond of a sum range and so on, plus some small amount, this will dramatically decrease the probability of unsustainability. So contingent plans, basically good, credible plan Bs is really the way to go, not just decrease debt today. It doesn't help a lot and it's very costly as I'll argue. So let me move, let me not, not go on uh, and discuss the last, last uh, line, which is some people do not like what I've said and think you have to have rules. What I suggest, and that again would be a long discussion, is that if you're going to have a rule it should not be as a function of the debt level, it should be as a function of the debt service. If the debt service goes up, then you should have a rule which requires the primary balance to improve. And that will do much better than any rule um, that debt service is really what you want to focus on. I think I'm going to skip that slide, given the, uh, the time that we have. But it is an important point, which is people say, well, fundamentals are OK. We should be OK. But what if investors get scared and there is a self-fulfilling equilibrium, a sunspot equilibrium? And the issue is, what can you do? So the first point is what I have found, and this is current research, is that in that case, if they worry, the range of debt over which multiple equilibria can take place is very large. So going from 100% debt to 90% will not do. You'd have to go to 30% or 40% before the bad equilibrium can happen. So that's not, again, the way to go. Um, you have to rely on central banks. But I want to argue that central banks may not be able to do the job. If it's a pure liquidity run without any change in fundamentals, yes, the central bank can be the stable investor. But if people start worrying about risk, then the fact that the central bank buys bonds and issues reserves 
doesn't change the liability of a consolidated government. And so it's not clear it actually does anything useful. And I think this is an issue we might be confronted by in the future. So let me move to the third and final part, which is, okay, so I've argued that, you know, there's no issue of that sustainability that I can see, but I've indicated how you can think about it. Now I want to move about, okay, how do you run fiscal policy? Welfare, in terms of welfare, not in terms of fiscal costs, but welfare costs of, and benefits of fiscal policy. So let me do that. So let's think about the welfare cost of debt. Okay. The standard answer is debt is bad uh, because it crowds out capital. And it may, depending on how it's financed, uh, put an undue burden on future generations who will have to pay more taxes out of a smaller uh, net output. Uh, the question is, in the context in which R is less than G, what does this say about these welfare costs? And we have two answers on the certainty. The first one, I mean, both are extremely well known. Uh, the first one was, uh, you know, derived by Phelps a uh, uh, long time ago, uh, which is that if I is less than G, this is a world of certainty, so there is only one interest rate, uh, then it's a sign that you've overaccumulated capital, that basically the marginal product of capital is less than the growth rate. And in this case, if you just ate some, some of the capital, then, you know, you'd have less output, yes, but you'd have more consumption because you would not have to carry this enormous amount of capital and the depreciation which comes with it. So we know from now that there can be such a thing as too much capital. It takes the form R is less than G. Then we have uh, results by uh, Diamond in this OLG model, well-known OLG model, which is that yes, in that case, if R is less than G, then using that is actually good. It crowds our capital, it always does, but this is good because there was too much. And what Diamond shows is that basically you should issue that until you've reduced capital, therefore increase the marginal product, therefore increase the rate. Again, this is all under certainty uh, until basically R is equal to G. You should at least get there. Uh, you may want to go further, but after this, it's a trade-off between welfare of different generations. So you may not want to. Okay, so we know Basically, even under certainty, R minus G, a negative, is, is a very strong signal of capital uh, of accumulation. I think for a long time, we thought, okay, that, you know, that should be in the textbook, and it surely is in Blanchard and Fisher, uh, but it's probably not tape, you rather than cannot be. And I think that what is happening is really forcing us uh, to think about it. So let me talk about welfare cost on the uncertainty in this slide and in the next slide. Which rates, now we go under uncertainty, there are all kinds of rates of return. Which one do you look at? If you look at the safe rate, we've seen it's less than G, so good. But if you look at the average marginal product of capital, basically it is above G and it has been above G every year since 1992. I give you two proxies for it. The first one is the uh, top line and it's earnings of non-financial corporations divided by their capital stock at replacement cost. Uh, and then the lower one is the same thing, but divided by market value. There's an interesting discussion as to which one you should use. It depends on how you see rents. But the point I want to make here is that, you know, the lowest value for each year since 1992 is 4% real. Uh, you know, where growth on average has been about, has been about 2% real growth. So which of the two rates? And as some of you probably know, this is what I did my AEA uh, address on, and I came to the following conclusions, which is that I take the diamond mall, I put uncertainty about technological uh, outcomes. And what I find is that if you look at the direct effects of that, so keeping the wage and the interest rate constant, then what you have to do is actually uh, the welfare effect depends on the comparison between the safe rate and the growth rate, exactly as on the certainty. Okay. And, and the reason is that in one case, you're comparing 
we say freight. In the other case, you're comparing, say, a pay-as-you-go social security system or a debt system, and these are safe transfers, and therefore, what is what matters is a safe rate. Now, Olivia, we have about four minutes left. Four minutes? Yeah. Okay. I told you to tell me ten minutes. <laughs> but Sorry. I'll, I'll do. I'll do the best. I'll do the best. I, I'll get very close. I think. Uh, bottom line is that it's a very nice result. But prices change and it complicates things. And I found that in a special case, very difficult to say in general, but basically the right way to look at in terms of the welfare implications is basically the average of the safe rate and the average risky rate. And when you go to the data, that's roughly the same as the growth rate. So my conclusion from that was that until we make more progress, we should basically think of that as not having obvious benefits, as it would be if there was truly uh, dynamic inefficiency, but not having large cost. Let me move on to the next uh, two slides. Uh, I think the message from this is when we look at welfare cost of that, they're likely to be very small in a world in which R is less than G. Now let me move to the welfare benefits of that uh, and deficits. And you know, we know that fiscal policy is useful in many ways, but it's useful for macro stabilization. Even when monetary policy is free to do what it wants, it cannot act very quickly. So fiscal policy is useful. We have automatic stabilizers which do some of the job that do it very quickly. Uh, we could do better. But that becomes much more relevant when monetary policy is at the ELB. Uh, when monetary policy is strictly at the ELB, then it cannot help. And therefore, fiscal policy has to come in. So if private demand is structurally too weak, then it has to be fiscal policy which does the job. Otherwise, there would be unemployment. If we are away from the ELB, but it's still potentially constraining, then it's clear that fiscal policy has to come to the rescue if there is an adverse shock. So the point of that slide is that because of the ELB, the previous slide was because of secular stagnation, welfare cost of debt are small because this slide says because of the ELB, the welfare benefits of deficits and debt are large. You put the two together and you're clearly more relaxed about using that as a smaller cost, as bigger benefits. The last slide is basically trying to get to the implications now. And again, I don't, I don't now have enough time, but I, let me go quickly through it, which is that today, the ELB is strictly binding. There is secular stagnation. Therefore, in order to basically, we still have uh, a negative output gap. Unemployment is above the natural rate. Uh, this means we have to continue running deficits. We don't like it, uh, but we have to. It's absolutely essential. If as time goes, and I expect aggregate demand will recover a bit, and nominal rates will increase, then the question is, what do we do? Do we basically reduce deficits, keeping the rates below, or do we keep deficits and allow the central banks to increase the rate? I argue that we should go, uh, we should do a mix of this. We should basically allow our star to increase quite a bit and run some deficits and then uh, find the right mix. Uh, given the time constraints, I will stop here, but maybe some of the points will be covered uh, by questions. Thank you very much, Giancarlo.